Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Felicity Scott. I'm director of the PhD program uh, at Columbia University. And I just wanted to um, offer this opportunity uh, for people to ask questions, but also to outline the, um, uh, the, the sort of core details of the PhD program and some of the key elements of the application process and, and really treat this like a sort of frequently asked question session in real time. And I also wanted to say that um, just while I make these opening remarks, we'll be uh, recording and and then we'll turn the recording off so you can ask questions without without being on camera. Um, so the, the first thing to, to say maybe is that the, the PhD program uh, at Columbia is, a, is an architectural history program or an architectural history and theory program. And, and I mentioned that um, because we are, are not a PhD in practice program. We don't um, accept people working in, in technology or in um, uh, you know, environmental technology and these things. We, we are a, a scholarly program, a program in the humanities. Uh, and I, I thought maybe also to, it'd be important to walk you through the, the, the core curriculum of the program, the, program um, uh, begins with, with two years of, of coursework. And in each of those years, students are, um, uh, they take a, a PhD colloquium in the fall. And so in the first year, you're with your second year co cohort. And with the, in the second year, you're with your first year colleagues. Um, in addition, and in the spring semester, there are um, either one or two PhD level seminars offered within GSEP. Um, and you're required to take at least one of them. Um, the rest of the curriculum are, is, is, is built around a series of distribution requirements. Um, and there are two 18th, 19th century requirements uh, and a pre-1750 requirement and requirement that you take a class that neither within the Graduate School of Architecture or Art History. And, um, uh, and this requirement tends to be particularly easy to uh, to fulfill, but it's uh, it's really a, a legacy of a period when when students would take almost primarily architectural history classes and wouldn't venture into the social sciences or even to history or political theory. Um, and and so the the core curriculum then is made up of required core sort of methods and content um, at the PhD level these distribution requirements, um, and then a series of, of, of electives. And, and so the main, yeah, quite literally the main part of the first two years is, is coursework um, and in which you're exposed to a variety of, of methods and of faculty. Uh, the third year of the program is, um, is when you prepare a series of bibliographies for your general exams or qualifying exams. Um, and begin to work on the dissertation perspective. So the third year is really encompassed by, um, by sort of taking responsibility for the secondary literature in your field, which is the, the, the sort of ambition of those general's exams. And, and then in conjunction with, a, with an advisor, developing a dissertation prospectus that, that is um, defended at the end of the spring of the third year. And, and maybe just to, to step back, I mentioned this right up front. Um, it's important to, to maybe say that we don't require applicants to have secured a dissertation advisor in advance. And, um, and that's because often people come in believing they'll work on one type of uh, topic and or area and end up working on something quite different by the time they get to their third year. And, um, and so students tend to, to, to work with or to, to decide on their, on their actual advisor in that third year. And so this is the reason I'm sure I've written to many of you to say, I don't require, we don't require you to have secured an advisor in advance because um, these things can often, uh, often change. Um, and so I think also maybe to say the, um, just a couple of, um, I mean, we can, go through many of the more fine details of the, the coursework. Oh, I don't know one thing it's important to say is that, you know, I mentioned that there's this requirement to take a course outside of GSEP or art history. Um, of course, we encourage students to work in 
a strong model of interdisciplinarity, which might well mean that you take many of your elective classes and even your distribution classes in, um, in a field that is um, at the core of your research interests. Um, so, um, let's see, what to say now? Oh, I should also mention there's a, a couple, you'll notice on the application um, site that there is a box that says ICLS, Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, and maybe even the program in comparative media. So these are two certificate programs that, that many of our students choose to, to work with. These are not in any way mandatory. They're also things you can apply for once you've been admitted and even started. Um, and and these, are, these are ways to, to have a foot in a sort of another program. For some people, it's entirely unnecessary to use that framework to develop a sort of core of expertise. For other people, it actually is an important part of the sort of pedagogical offerings um, um, at, the, at the university. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, a number of people have asked me about um, um, securing funding outside. Uh, we admit three students a year and we fully fund them for, um, for five years. Um, students often tend to take six or seven years to complete a PhD uh, at Columbia and they seek uh, external funding through grants or sometimes teaching either here or at other institutions to, to, to um, supplement that funding in those final years. Um, so there's no need to secure funding from governments and other sources. If you're admitted, you will come fully funded. Um, and so it's unlike a, a European PhD situation where often you might actually have to secure financing in advance. This is not something we require at all. Uh, another core part of the, the program uh, are teaching requirements. And this is actually a Columbia wide um, um, uh, mandate and the, the opportunity to, to teach in the core program is really seen, <clears throat> um, you know, seen as teacher training, but it's seen very much also as a core part of the pedagogy, um, the way we do that. At GSAP is to have you teach in your second and third year of the program within the core sequence in architectural history within the, the MR program, the Masters of Architecture program. Um, that, that core history sequence is now, has been restructured a number of years ago. It's no longer as a large lecture. Um, we divide the, the first year MR students into, into three groups. Um, uh, it's a uh, a pedagogy based in a more Socratic method. Um, the course is called Questions in Architectural History. So it's not uh, a, a sort of lecture imparting knowledge. It's actually conceived as a, a very engaged um, conversation with the students. And so the three sections, each are about 30 students, uh, one faculty member and two teaching fellows. And so you're, the teaching, uh, the teacher training comes in the form of, of you being with somebody from the second or third year, depending on what your year is, and um, being both in the main section of that class, but also then running an independent section with half of those students. And, um, and so this is, again, something you do in the second and third year. There are also often opportunities to teach in years beyond that. There's a, a sort of um, a competitive opportunity, let's say, where students that have defended their dissertation prospectus are able to offer um, a graduate seminar, for which, of course, you would receive additional compensation. There's also some fantastic opportunities over the summer teaching in the advanced architectural designs uh, first summer semester that many of our students take um, uh, take the opportunity to teach that also comes with additional compensation. And there are occasionally other forms of uh, teaching for students in their fourth, fifth, sixth, and um, really fourth, fifth, and sixth years. Um, oh, another couple of core requirements beyond the teaching um, are uh, language requirements. There are two language requirements that, that students tend to, if they don't come with languages in advance and you don't have to come with languages in advance, they tend to, to spend the first and second summer um, prior to uh, 
uh, taking the qualifying exams to fulfill these language requirements. They are um, graduate proficiency um, based language requirements. So if you really need to learn a language to a conversational level, then we advise you to take the core language classes in the regular academic year. But this is actually not the nature of the requirement. The requirement is that you develop some proficiency in reading and translation. Um, uh, that is rather is, is something you can fulfill with, uh, I think it's like a six week intensive um, uh, graduate training over the summer. Uh, if there are very obscure languages that you need to acquire, um, uh, like Kishwa or things like this, things that, that Columbia doesn't teach, then we work with you to find uh, an available institution that, that would teach them. Um, okay, so that's sort of program basics, you know, core, core classes and distribution requirements, teaching requirements, language requirements, um, uh, and funding. And then I thought it was useful to, to just work through the basics of the application process and um, um, both from sort of your side and let's say from our side as, as the faculty. Um, firstly, to say we, we make admissions decisions as a committee. And this is another reason why, uh, you know, I've been stressing that you don't need to choose an advisor in advance. It's not that that I would choose a student that I want to work with, or Mabel Wilson would choose a student that she wanted to work with, uh, or Thea Karekawala would choose. We don't, we don't admit students as individual faculties. We admit them as a committee. So we all have equal votings. We all work through the applications um, and again, make a, make a collective decision um, about the, the three students that we will admit. Um, and and um, and I should say we also just um, uh, we also typically uh, um, have a, a, a wait list which we don't tend to rank. Um, so, but the application basics that the really the core document in the application for us, and often the first thing we read, is the application statement. Um, there is a, a limit set on the applications website, which is uh, you should take as a as a guideline, if you need another 500 words to to um, um, to, to to really make a, a claim about um, what your research interests are, of course, take them. Um, um, but don't give us 4,000 words. You have to, you know, imagine that there's a lot of applications that we're working through. This is a, a succinct statement. The ambition of which is for you to to make a a claim um, about what your research interests are, what your scholarly interests are, what type of contribution to the field you're hoping to make and, and to outline the sort of dissertation research that you're planning to, um, to, to work on. And when I say the sort of dissertation research, what I'm alluding to is that it's not a dissertation prospectus that you will be um, outlining. Certainly it's important to give us some details of you know, who, what, when, where and why, um, but you're not expected to be able to say these are the the you know four chapters of my dissertation. You're not expected to to know in advance all the details of what you're planning to work on. And again, to come back to the point I made earlier, that's because often people might come in imagining that they're going to work on um, uh, uh, you know, a topic in 19th century Ottoman Empire and end up working in 20th century um, uh, Cairo, you know, and, and, and so, so these are, are changes that, that you can't anticipate in advance. And so we read that statement really as an indication of um, how does this student present themselves as a scholar? Uh, do they understand what graduate level research projects are? Uh, do they understand the, the sort of, you know, archival and, and scholarly ways of presenting academic work in the field of architectural history and theory. And so I know that's a very generic framework, but um, I put it in generic terms because of course the specifics are going to vary widely um, uh, across your interests. But you should think of it as a document that both makes um, uh, a somewhat broader claim to how you would situate yourself 
you know, are you a 20th century scholar of X, Y, or Z? Or, you know, are you um, uh, a scholar entering the field through a methodological conceit in, you know, decolonial methodologies or in, so I want, you know, we're looking for how you sort of present your core interests and then how you imagine those interests would translate into a research project. Um, it's entirely up to you whether you whether you uh, include biographical information. For some people, it's actually important to to account for you know changes in your career paths or or the sort of motivation for entering into a into a, a PhD program that's sort of scholarly mode coming out of a of a um, of a more professionally oriented mode, but but. We're reading it primarily to understand your scholarly interests, um, uh, your biographical um, um, background may or may not be relevant. You know, we, we leave that up to you to, to decide depending on the specifics of your, um, your background and your research interests. Uh, while I remember to say it, um, uh, it's also not mandatory that you come from a professional background. I would say something like, the majority of our students um, have come through a master's of architecture or a master's of architectural history um, uh, program in some form, but we regularly take students that have come from different disciplines, but have been working or intend to work on something very closely related to architecture in the broadest sense, architecture, urbanism, landscape architecture, histories of design. Um, and, uh, and so it's, more important that your your current interests relate to architecture than that you come from a background. Um, again, most of our students do come from a background in architecture, but that is not um, um, not universal by any means. Um, uh, you'll note that I mentioned that you might have a master's degree. This is actually mandatory, unlike degrees in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Like if you're applying to art history, you wouldn't need a master's degree. All of our students come in with a master's degree. Um, they come in with what we call advanced standing. Um, and this is actually what allows for uh, students to only have to take 13 classes in the first two years of their program. Um, so you do need to have a master's degree to apply to the program. Um, you don't need to have finished that by the time you apply. What do I mean by that? You might be in the final year, of that degree now, uh, you'll be applying in early January, you'll only get the degree in May, that's fine. This is often something that happens, you'll have to complete that degree to begin, um, but you don't have to have completed it before you apply. Um, so this is not, not a concern. Um, um, we trust that you will complete it. I mean, you will have to complete it to, uh, to begin, but it's not something you need to, to finish in advance. So the statement, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's succinct, it should be um, clear, obviously, well written, it should make a claim about your scholarly interests. Um, if there are other parts of the university that are relevant to your um, uh, intended, intended work at Columbia, in other words, if, if you have um, an interest in in um, Latin American history and and the Institute for Latin American and Iberian Studies. If, if if this is a something that would that would make Colombia a very clear choice for you, that might be something important to mention. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to have reached out to particular faculty in those departments or in our department, um, but it means that. That you've you know made a made a a clear attempt to 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 work out that Columbia has the resources for your project in order to pursue them. So yeah, important to think of the program within the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, but also within a university with other types of um, of scholarly resources. Um, so the second um, sort of core part of the application is the writing sample. Uh, we give you a, um, um, a sort of a guideline for numbers of pages. If you have a few, you know, if you, I mean, you don't have exactly the number, if it's a 
five pages under or 15 pages over, that's totally fine. What we don't want is you to give us 200 pages and expect us to read you know, a vast amount of your work. So you need to edit yourself. Um, we don't expect those writing samples to be demonstrations that you've already undertaken, extensive research in the field that you're proposing to work on. We read them as writing samples. So um, what does that mean? Uh, that means where we're looking to say, you know, how does this candidate make an argument? How do they mobilize resources? Uh, you know, are they, are they following an intellectually interesting um, um, uh, line of, of sort of research and argumentation? We really read that as another way of you characterizing yourself as a scholar. So you should give us the strongest pieces of writing that you have. Um, they can be um, short pieces. You can have multiple short pieces. You can have one longer piece. Um, uh, you really need to think of presenting the best piece of your work in, in, that, in that context. If you want to give us an excerpt from a larger document, you might have a, a thesis document, which is 200 pages. Then give us a piece of that with a cover note saying, this is an excerpt from a larger document, so we understand what we're reading. Um, but again, um, it's a occasion also for you to, to um, demonstrate that you know how to edit, edit yourself and present yourself in the most professional light. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also the, if there are different types of text that you want to include, um, that might be also something you note on a cover note. It might be self-evident, there's no need to make a cover note, but I just suggest that as something that you can think about doing. Um, another, another key piece of the application is the, is the CV or resume. And I, I um, mentioned this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's another channel for us to understand where you've been to school, you know, what type of capacities you've worked in, um, and, and so it's also a, a way of, of taking some of the burden off the statement and a, we can we have another channel of information to understand where you've come from and, um, um, and what you've done. Um, and I, I should say, while I remember, a lot of people imagine that you have to have had publications like texts in print prior to applying. This is, um, this is, is uh, not something that we require. Um, we, again, we're looking for students who we think are going to make the most interesting and significant contributions to the field of architectural history and theory. This is a, a program that tries to you know, advance scholarship in the field and to see our students and graduates as, as, as leaders, as really thinking the future of the field and its, and its pedagogy. So, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people. Um, we don't say, oh, this year we're going to take people working in, in this type of project. We take students, um, um, you know, according, according to their strengths, but according to, to a sort of collective understanding of, of, of whether, whether we think the work is significant or will become significant um, with, with, with further training. So, so the CV, you know, is an important uh, document. Um, um, occasionally get asked if there's a, um, a length limit. You know, I don't really think so. It's a, it's a feel just, again, you know, edit yourself, think about what should a CV look like for applying to an academic program. It might look quite different to a CV if you're applying to a professional job as an architect. Um, so again, it's a channel of, of presenting yourself in the most professional uh, or you know, scholarly light. Um, the other key part of, um, of the application process are letters of recommendation. Um, they're a, a requirement of three letters. Sometimes people ask if they have to offer a four because sometimes there's a field for a fourth letter. No, we don't require a fourth letter. That's occasionally other departments at the university. Um, you know, do encourage that. And so the field there is a generic one. We require three. Um, you should choose your, your recommendation, uh, your recommenders according to their ability to, um, uh, to you know, testify to your strengths and your preparedness for scholarly work in an, in a, in an academic PhD program. 
Um, and, you know, it could be that one of the letters is somebody that can testify to your teaching. You don't need to have that. We're really looking for people that can speak to your ability to, to, to thrive in a PhD program. Um, so what does that mean? That means um, that, you know, you might well have worked for a very famous architect. They're probably not the best person to tell us about your scholarly capacities. And so, you know, you don't have to, I mean, I won't give an example, but sometimes we get famous architects writing to us and they, um, it's not, you know, they are not really able to tell us um, about whether or not you have the, the capacity to, to write, to research, to make an argument. Um, the, uh, another question that I often ask is, can I use a recommender from an undergraduate degree? Yes, of course, that's fine. If you work very closely with somebody in your undergraduate degree and you feel like um, uh, they are a good, um, a good person to write, of course, uh, that's absolutely fine. Can you use three letters from the same institution? Yes, that's fine. Um, I also often have the question, um, oh, I went through Columbia. Can I use Columbia faculty to recommend? Yes, that's also fine. Um, so we don't have clear restrictions. We, we, we um, you know, expect you to think about who can um, really, you know, again, testify to your ability to, to, to thrive within a program like this. Um, so let me think what else I should say. Um, I'll also say, you know, uh, there is, we'll often ask if they should speak to many faculty um, who are on the PhD committee before applying. This is not necessary if there's, um, someone who you have specific questions for um, that, that you, you really feel you need to speak to, of course, reach out to them. Um, but this is not in any way necessary. We, we um, uh, you know, most of the people we admit, we've not necessarily spoken to. So, so I know people get very anxious and you know, I know there are, are websites that recommend that you have to speak to people. It's actually not necessary. Um, and often we just don't have time to speak to 90 people individually. So it's really um, something you should uh, you know, think carefully about. Um, likewise with campus visits, um, of course you can visit the campus. We, we don't set up um, sort of organized tours of the, of the campus. They're the sort of in-person open houses that, that are run by GSAP. Um, tend to be more directed towards the master's programs. And you know, these are, uh, for the doctoral program, we, we don't actually um, uh, set up and organize in-person open houses. That being said, of course you can visit. Um, uh, people also say, ask questions about whether they can come and sit in on a class. Um, if you've been admitted to the program, yes, you know that's the moment in which it might make more sense to come and do that. We also obviously can't have lots of people coming and sitting in on seminars in the course of the, the fall semester or even the early spring. Um, so these are the sorts of things that, that tend to be more appropriate for um, um, uh, candidates that have been admitted to the program. Um, likewise, with speaking to current students, we you know set those beings up once people have been admitted. Um, I think, let me think, what else did I want to talk through? Oh, the other, of course, you're required to submit your transcripts. Um, and um, just to alleviate your concerns, we're used to seeing transcripts from many different institutions with different grading structures. And they, of course, all have um, a sort of key to understanding what the norms are in your institution. So. Um, you don't need to worry too much about our ability to interpret transcripts. Um, we become experts in the broad variety of transcript models uh, in the course of doing these applications. So I think that's um, something that you don't really need to be concerned about. Um, um, there are language requirements for people who, who have not um, um, undertaken a number of years of training in an English language institution or whose first language isn't English um, for obvious reasons. But I think they are the 
the sort of extent of the requirements that that I need to sort of underscore in this in this um, um, in this sense. So let me think. So maybe um, uh, I know there's a very generic overview, but I just wanted to to sort of talk through key aspects of the program. We also the students, I should say, there there are a number of um, of initiatives, both student-run initiatives and um, and um, sort of school-wide initiatives that that are also important to the pedagogy in the program. The students have been running a workshop for a number of years where they invite people that they want to be in dialogue with to come and talk to them um, uh, in, a, in a private session. Um, we are um, you know, also developing um, um, uh, a series of other initiatives, getting students and recent alumni to, to present aspects of their work, the formulation of their work, to have a sort of collective conversation about, about methods and the formulation of projects. There, of course, are, are uh, is a large, are a large number of important um, public programs within the school and uh, other parts of the university that that are also very important, like the Collins Kaufman session that's jointly run between art history um, and GSEP. Our students are often involved with initiatives like that. I think that's I think that's sort of most of the the core pieces that I wanted to stress. So um, I know that there are always um, um, uh, issues that I forget in outlining these sorts of issues, and but also. Um, uh, that the questions that you might have are often enormously relevant for um, for your for your colleagues. So, so maybe Stefan, if we can um, turn off the recording, and I can um, see who has questions and 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 continue the conversation from there. <laughs> 